received a couple of requests to talk about constant elasticity of substitution, utility and production functions. Uh, what people have wanted me to do is give some examples of using these functions, say with Lagrangians, to maximize or minimize something. But before we go through and actually use a CES utility or production function, I wanted to make sure that we know what we're talking about here. So CES stands for Constant Elasticity of Substitution. And first, let's just look, let's get a look at what these functions look like. Now, there are a lot of different ways that people will use these. Let me start with kind of the most general form, but we're just going to look at two goods. So if we're talking about a utility function, a little bit more common to use these in production. You'd have uh, equal parentheses. Now you can have a multiplier here, and we'll talk about what effect that has in a bit. AX to the row, or P, we might call it, um, plus B times good Y to the row raised to the one over row power. So this is kind of the standard general form of a constant elasticity of substitution function. Now, if you're using it as a utility function, this is, this is a little bit more typical of the way you would use it in a production function. So let me write Q equals here, but you could use that for utility and context is, is not a lot different there. But when it comes to utility, you'll more often find people using the much simpler form, often without these multipliers A and B. So a lot of times you'll see it just written as x to the row plus y to the row, which is kind of boring without those multipliers, but still with the one over row exponent there. However, when people use this form for utility, they're doing it just to make the problem a little bit harder than they need to be. Now, why? Well, utility, unlike quantity of output, quantity of output's a real thing, but utility is an imaginary thing that are, are in, in units of utils. Utility itself, the measure of utility itself is not important. Relative amounts of utility is what's really important. And so if you have any utility function and you give it what we call a positive monotonic transformation, I'll just write X form for short there, positive monotonic transformation, that means that you're not changing the slope and higher levels of utility on the original scale are still gonna be higher than numbers on the other scale, even though you've, you've changed it a bit, it's gonna give you exactly the same preferences. For example, you can take any utility function like this one, or you could take a Cobb-Douglas utility function like you know x to the three times y to the four, I don't know, and I'm sorry, yeah, that's a crazy looking three there. And simplest kind of positive monotonic transformation you could do is just multiply that whole thing by 10. That changes the scale, changes kind of the units of utility, but it's not gonna affect the predictions of the choices that people are gonna make, no matter whether you put the 10 there or whether you don't for utility. And there are a lot of other things that you can do that are positive monotonic transformations that do not change the predictions. They change the answer for how much utility somebody would get, but it's, again, it's a made up construct. It's not a real thing. One thing you can do to these utility functions or any utility function, but the constant elasticity of substitution one in particular is just, you could get rid of that exponent altogether. The one over rho, one over P, and it's not gonna change the predictions for choice that people are going to make give them a budget, give them prices. It doesn't matter, the one over row, it just makes the math a little bit harder. When it comes to a production function, you can't go mucking around with it like that because whenever you do anything that affects the, the Q, I mean, the Q is really a, an important part here. If you ever have a problem where somebody wants you to do a, a utility analysis and they give you this constant elasticity of substitution function with the one over row there, and you just want to check your answers, just do the same problem, but erase the one over row and make sure that your X and Y solutions check out. Okay, now that we know what a CES function looks like, what is elasticity of substitution? Let's, let's spend a few minutes 
on what this idea is. An elasticity, any elasticity, E, is a percent change over a percent change. So percent change in you know quantity divided by percent change in price, that might be price elasticity of demand, for example. But when it comes to elasticity of substitution, what we're talking about is a measure that tells us how easy is it to substitute between inputs. How easy is it to substitute between inputs? And here we just have two inputs that we're looking at, but this idea generalizes to any number of inputs that you want. And you can, you can take these CES production functions and you can extend them to any number of goods that you want. Just keep on adding C, Z, etc. You get the idea. So elasticity of substitution is asking the question, how easy is it for a business typically, is where the idea came from, to substitute between labor and capital or any number of inputs? If it's very easy, we're going to have a high elasticity of substitution. If it's very hard or impossible to substitute at all, we're going to have a zero elasticity of substitution. So this elasticity, percent change over percent change, here is the elasticity we're talking about. On the top, we have the ratio of the inputs, y over x. So think about capital and labor. Are we using a lot of capital compared to labor? Or if we're in a consumption kind of paradigm, are we consuming a lot of Y compared to how much X? So again, this is a little bit more natural concept to talk about when you're talking about capital and labor. So if you're in a very capital intensive business, then this ratio would be high. But what we're talking about here is by what percent is that changing as we move between two points? Now, what two points? Well, what we're talking about here is percent change in the marginal rate of substitution or the marginal rate of technical substitution if you're talking about a production sort of example. To visualize what we're talking about here, let's talk about labor and capital. If we have an isoquant, isoquant telling us a certain amount that we might want to produce, or this could be a, an indifference curve in a utility framework. If we move between two points on this indifference curve, between point A and point B here, the elasticity of substitution was, would be asking this question. What's the slope of that indifference curve doing? What's happening to the slope at A compared to the slope at B? Let's just make up a couple of numbers here. Let's suppose that the slope here is 2, and here the slope is 1. Now, those are going to be negative, of course, but let's just talk about an, an absolute value. So the slope's going from minus 2 to minus 1. The percent change here, if we're going from 2 to 1, we might say, okay, that's about a 50% decrease in the slope, going from 2 to 1. Okay, so that would be the percent change in the marginal rate of technical substitution on the bottom. So that would go on the bottom of our elasticity formula. On the top, when we would be asking the question, between these two points, A and B, what's happening to the ratio of capital to labor that we're using? Now, the capital to labor ratio is very easily visualized as a ray from the origin out to that point. The slope of this blue line here tells us the capital labor ratio. Why? Well, because the slope is between 0 and k. That's the rise. And the run is between 0 and how much L. Sorry, how much L we're talking about over here. Uh, and then we, if we had another ray from the origin pointing at B, the slope of that line tells us the capital labor ratio at B capital labor ratio is going to be lower because the slope of ray B is not as steep as ray A. So that's kind of a way to visualize what's happening to the capital labor ratio, what's happening to the slope of these rays as we move along. And here let's just, let's assume that maybe the slope of A, slope of ray A, eh, let's say that's 1.5 and maybe the slope at B is 1, okay, just to give us a number. 
So what percent change would that be? Well, let's just kind of do a calculation in our head. And if we're going from 1.5 to 1, then that's about a 33% decrease. So about a 33%, okay? And so we would say that the elasticity of substitution along this arc between A and B would be around 0.66. That would be the elasticity of substitution. And again, this is just something that with production processes that if, if you have data that you can look at, you have several different observations of how a company has chosen to produce the same output in different ways, right? So this might be an isoquant of Q equals 100. You can measure this elasticity of substitution along different points of the curve. Now, a constant elasticity of substitution function, of course, assumes that this elasticity of substitution is constant as you move along any two points on any indifference curve. The elasticity of substitution is always going to remain constant. Now let's get a, a feeling for what different values of this elasticity of substitution might mean. So let's zoom in over here. So again, let's think about labor and capital. If we had a production process where the isoquants looked like this, this means the inputs are perfect substitutes that you can very, very, very easily substitute between capital and labor, we would say that the elasticity of substitution is infinity. Because why? Well, if we look at our formula for elasticity of substitution, it's the percent change in the capital labor ratio here on the top and percent change in the MRS on the bottom. And so as we go, you can see that the bottom, the sl right, the slope of this indifference curve as we move is not going to be changing because it's a straight line. So the percent change in the MRS goes to zero basically. And I know don't divide by zero, but when you divide by a tiny small number, we're, that, that means we head towards infinity if we take the appropriate limit, right? But as you move between points, of course, the slope of this ray that tells you the capital labor ratio is going to be changing. So when you have something over nothing, eh, take the appropriate limit, you're going to, to infinity. So perfect substitutes is perfectly elastic when you talk about elasticity of substitution. Very easy to substitute between capital and labor. You don't really lose anything when you do so. So in this kind of case, you're going to just use the cheapest, cheapest one. Is it capital or is it labor? What about something that's a little harder for elasticity of substitution? So if we had a pretty flat isoquant, not perfectly flat, but pretty flat, then we would be talking about a pretty elastic uh, case here. This might be elasticity of substitution around five, the way I'm drawing it. Again, these aren't scientific. This is just to give you a picture of what these things might look like. And as we go towards lower and lower and lower elasticity of substitution, we get more and more like an L shape. And now you can kind of tell, so this might be an elasticity of substitution of one. Now you can tell what's going to happen kind of as we get towards an elasticity of substitution of zero that is when we have a Leontief production function, right, where it's perfectly a right angle. And this would be perfect complements. Fixed ratios of labor and capital needed. So, for example, for every shovel, you need one person. Or for every bulldozer, you need three people, one driver and two people to maintain it, for example. So this would be perfect complements, and the elasticity of substitution would be zero in that case. Absolutely impossible to substitute between capital and labor in this case. Okay, I think we've got our, our feet pretty well grounded now in what we're talking about.
let me give you a little bit of history and then let me take you into Maple and we will look at a, a couple of three-dimensional graphs. Well, before, before we go there, let me just kind of give you the, the upshot. There's a relationship. This, this row and the formula up here is not the elasticity of substitution, but it's related to the elasticity of substitution. So the typical symbol we'll use for elasticity of substitution is sigma, lowercase sigma here. And in this formula, the way to get the elasticity of substitution from rho is it's 1 over 1 minus rho. So what does this imply? Well, if rho is 1, then you get 1 over 1 minus 1, which again, we're taking some kind of limit here. That gives you an elasticity of substitution of infinity. If rho equals some negative large number here, say minus 100, minus 1,000, minus whatever, then what you're getting is an elasticity of substitution that is going to be very, very close to zero as that row parameter gets larger and larger. And again, when, when that elasticity of substitution gets close to zero, that's when you're getting into this perfect complements sort of arena. One gives you infinite elasticity of substitution, perfect substitutes. A large negative number gives you perfect complements. And a, like a, you could do like a small number, like instead of one, you could do minus one, or you could do minus five. You can get all kinds of different elasticity of substitution numbers for various rows. And you can get these intermediate sort of shapes here that are a little bit more typical of what we might be used to seeing when we look at an, an isoquant. Okay, let me give you a little bit of history here. The, this constant elasticity of substitution formula did originate when looking at production functions, not for utility. Although a few people have looked at it in the case of utility analysis. So let's take a look at some history of these constant elasticity of scale functions and where they came from. So this is the paper where constant elasticity of substitution functions originated. And look at this kind of powerhouse group here. Kenneth Arrow, Minhas, and Bob Solo. All these guys, very well published, very smart people, two Nobel Prize winners among them. So these guys invented the constant elasticity of substitution production function because right here they, they talk about how up until that time, they had basically two common choices whenever they were, wanted to do analysis of production. They had the, the ONTF kind of function, and the ONTF functions are those ones where you, you're assuming perfect complements, fixed ratio of labor and capital, which isn't very realistic. The other common one was the Cobb-Douglas, and the Cobb-Douglas is okay, but it's not perfect. And another interesting thing about the Cobb-Douglas is that the it is also a constant elasticity of substitution production or utility function. It's just that the elasticity of substitution in a Cobb-Douglas is always equal to one. So if you want to look at production or utility and have a little bit more flexible form where you don't want the elasticity of substitution to always be zero or always be one, but be a little more flexible to have any elasticity of substitution that you want, they wanted to see if there was such a function and they're the ones who figured it out. So pretty cool. Now let's now look at what these indifference curves look like. I, I've already shown you basically, but it's seeing is, is always believing and I'm going to make you some pretty 3D graphs and we'll wrap up this video in the next minute. So this is Maple. I'll, uh, I'll put this file in case anybody has Maple. I'll put this file on www.berkeyacademy.com. I'll call it just CES and uh, it'll be a Maple file uh, on, under files on my website. So just hit an enter here. Um, in this first function here, I'm going to set the parameter row equal to minus a thousand. And so what that's going to do is give us indifference curves that have a, an elasticity of substitution close to zero. So this is going to be closer to that Leontief or perfect complements kind of idea here. 
So here's the, here it is in 3D. Let me make that a little bit bigger here. So you can see we've, we've kind of made a pyramid shape, but when you turn this up and you look at those isoquants, you can see the familiar L shape of the perfect complements functions. Now, if we change this to be minus one, as I was talking about before, oh, I'm sorry, not minus one, one, what in the world? So if, if you put in minus one, you actually get indifference curves or isoquants that look pretty similar to what you might see in a Cobb Douglas. Uh, and here I've set the, those A and B parameters equal to one as well. I'm sorry, not one, but if you put it, not minus one, but if you put in positive one, that's where that one over one minus rho is going to give you perfect substitutes in production. So again, this is just a, a plane. And so when you rotate this down and you look at those isoquants or indifference curves, they turn into just perfectly straight lines here. Now, before we end, let me just do one other thing here. And that is, let me change this back to that minus one where we're going to get, you know, some of these reasonable indifference curves. The, the one problem with having indifference curves or uh, isoquants this way is they're perfectly symmetrical around the uh, center here. If you had one input that was different in some way than another, that's where these multipliers come in here, the A and the B. So let's just change A to two real quick, and then we'll end this video just so you can see how that makes these isoquants or indifference curves not symmetric anymore. You see they're spaced further apart over here on the y-axis as X increases, but spaced much closer together here along the x-axis as we're increasing Y. So we can see that this, this hill is gonna be steeper uh, on this side as we go toward increasing y than over here if we were going toward increasing x. Okay, that's going to wrap up this video. In the next couple of videos, I'm going to look at a couple of example problems where we're going to maximize utility using a function like this to show you what the mathematics looks like and how it works out. So this is Berkey Academy signing off. Stay in tune for the next video. And if you like this video, please like it. And if you like my work, consider subscribing. Good luck with your studies, guys.